everybody. Hope you all are enjoying yourselves. Uh, this is going to be a brief, well, about maybe about an hour. I'll be reading from Talisman, uh, which of course in my thing is backwards, I think. Um, you can see the cover there in the, the stream if you're watching on Twitch. Uh, this is a short story collection released in 1994, uh, not long after Earth Dawn was originally launched. Um, it's kind of cool in that it is a collection of short stories by different authors, um, but they all sort of collectively together tell an overarching story. Uh, and so we will start, get through one or two of these, depending on how long it goes through. And I hope you enjoy your time with me here today. Uh, I'm be reading from because we don't have digital copies of this. I'm going to be reading the the print copy. Um, Owen, uh, this is Earth Dawn, so maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> Happy bedtime story, or will I have nightmares? Nightmares, but but, but happy nightmares, you know. All right. Prologue. Before science, before history, there was an age of magic and legend, an age of heroism and of terror, the age of Earth Dawn. In this mythical time, magic flowed freely. Mages, swordmasters, troubadours, and smiths bent the patterns of life with their mystical powers. But the dawn of magic also weakened the fabric of the metaplanes. Horrific creatures from the astral plane began to spring forth into the world, ravaging the land, the waters, and mankind. At first, the horrors were few and weak, but over time they grew many, strong, and deadly. They were a pestilent tide, a scourge that could not be turned back. The great mages of the Theron Empire understood the futility of fighting this scourge from beyond, and so they prepared their peoples, villages, and cities for the day of the sealing. The people would build great underground cares, sealed and warded by magic, where they would wait for centuries as the horrors roamed and devastated the land above. For five hundred years, humanity would live deep in the belly of the earth, waiting in the darkness, waiting for the day when the doors could be unsealed, opened once more onto the beloved earth, waiting for the day when the people could finally re-emerge and again reclaim the light. Excuse me for a sec. Prison of Stone by Louis J. Prosperi. What is it? The wizard shouted angrily when the pounding at the door didn't stop. Linthus had never seen Noraim like this, had never so much as heard him raise his voice in the two years she'd been studying wizardry with him. Oh, he could be stern enough at times, but never loud or rude. Then again, not often did anyone interrupt Noraim while he was working. Brella Tonnen sent me to collect you, came a voice muffled by the thick door of the wizard's study. He says the matter is urgent. Noraim stood up so abruptly that the tome lying open on the table was knocked to the floor. Indeed, so agitated did the wizard look that Linthus half expected him to seize the edge of the table and overturn it in sheer irritation. All right, man, I'm coming, he barked, not even deigning to open the door. Then he turned to Linthus. We'd best cut short our lesson for today, he told her, once more assuming his courteous voice and manner. It seems the Brella wishes to see me. We will resume our study of enhanced matrices tomorrow. While Noraim quickly made his preparations to go, Linthus stood up on the table, shook out her wings, and rose into the air. As she flew over to get her pack, she saw the wizard hastily smoothing his white beard and combing the thinning strands of hair on his head with his fingers. The wide sleeves of his robe grazed the floor as he bent to pick up the fallen book, the robe opening slightly to reveal the dull brown of the tunic that was standard garb for a Theron. In sharp contrast was the blue of Noraim's wizard robe, the color as brilliant as a clear sky on a summer's day, the fine cloth embroidered with many beautiful patterns and colors, some geometric, some lifelike representations of creatures large and small. Those who didn't know the meaning of the robe's patterns and colors might have mistaken Noraim for little more than a bearded, white-haired old man, but Linthus knew that he was a powerful wizard indeed. Despite that, Noraim's manner had always been somewhat subdued, almost as though he were sadly resigned to a life of teaching novices the secrets and mysteries of his art. 
Now Linthus was suddenly seeing another side of the man. He almost seemed to stand taller, and his high-boned features showed the almost arrogant nobility of the typical Theron face. As she too made ready to go, Linthus stretched as tall as her small windling body would permit, releasing the stiffness that accompanied their long hours of discussion and study. Her tiny form was nearly lost against the dark expanse of table, but that was a fact of life for a windling, something to which anyone of her race soon became accustomed. The world and its trappings were made more to the scale of the other, larger, name-giving races, but Linthus had never considered her small size any disadvantage. What did it matter that she was but eighteen inches tall? Did not a windling make it up in winged quickness and adaptability of spirit? Her slight body lifted into the air as Noraim opened the door to leave, permitting Linthus to also exit the confines of the study. Hovering like a hummingbird, she paused briefly to watch her teacher stride quickly down the corridor, followed by the guard sent to escort him to an audience with the Brella. What might Brella Tonin want with Noraim? she wondered. Why would he have need of the services of a teaching magician? Perhaps one of the Brella's offspring or protégés was a prospective student of wizardry. That must be it, she decided, for there were few better teachers in Vivane. In fact, as far as she knew, Noraim was one of the greatest of the wizards who had come to Barsave from Thera. And how fortunate that he was her teacher! She might have been assigned to so many others, yet Linthus was lucky enough to have been apprenticed to Noraim Everthought. She was learning more from him than from any previous master, and in much less time. She only hoped that when the day came for her to teach the others, she would do as well as Noraim. Returning the next day for her lesson, Linthus was startled at what awaited her. Instead of Noraim ready to scold her chronic tardiness, it was one of the Brella's guards who met her. Noraim commands that you wait for him. He will be with you shortly. Notwithstanding Noraim's absence, Linthus found this message singular. When had the wizard ever commanded her to do anything? Though both were citizens of the Theron Empire, with its highly stratified society, Noraim had always treated her as more or less an equal, at least in social standing, if not in mastery. She glided down to her usual spot on the table and took out the book she used as a journal, a notebook for lessons, and even sometimes as a grimoire. Noraim had always impressed on her the importance of keeping a formal grimoire, but Linthus occasionally made do with just her notebook. While waiting for her teacher, she would make good use of her time by reviewing her notes of past lessons. That the guard remained in place surprised her. You may go, she told him. The guard turned to her and huffed out his response. Brelatonin has commanded that Noraim be attended at all times. There was that word commanded again. Having grown up Theron, Linthus had spent only a brief part of her childhood in the forests usually favored by windlings, but it had been enough to imprint her with the ways and customs of her race. The chain of authority mentality that saturated Theron society was often totally at odds with what she knew as a windling's natural love of freedom. Linthus also, th also thought it odd that the Brella would demand that Noraim be attended at all times. Indeed, in her two years with Noraim, this was the first and only time the Brella had ever paid her teacher any notice. She was still mulling over these thoughts when Noraim suddenly came rushing into the study, shouting for the guard to leave, then drowning out the man's protest by slamming the door. Ah, Linthus! I apologize for the delay, but things have become quite hectic since my meeting with the Brella yesterday. As a result of that interview, I have revised our course of study. He held up a hand to forestall any interruption. Yes, I know we had planned to continue our work with enhanced spell matrices, but now I will need your assistance in a new project instead. Linthus couldn't imagine any project the Brella might possibly assign nor aim that would require any help from her, but he quickly went on to explain. The Brella has been reassigned to an important post in the Great Sea of Parlanth from where he will travel throughout Barsave, enforcing the collection of the Empire's tithes. This is a great honor, which the Brella has long coveted, but he also fears it. He is convinced that every person, tree, and rock in Barsave must be shielding a horror, just waiting to attack and destroy him. His fear of the horrors is almost palpable. He has commanded that I construct him a magical device that will warn him of the presence of any horror or horror-tainted being who approaches him, and he has given me but two weeks to accomplish it. I attempted to explain the difficulties of such a task, even had I two years instead of two weeks, but he would hear none of it. I explained that the scourge will not come even in our children's children's lifetime, but that does not reassure the Brella. He demands protection from horrors regardless of the cost, logic, or feasibility. That is why I have spent almost every hour since yesterday doing research and study in the library. 
To assist me in the work, I have ordered the delivery of a number of ancient texts to my laboratory, where I can pursue this matter in the proper environment, and with your help. But isn't this your laboratory? asked Linthus. Oh, passions, no. This is just a study where I meet students for their lessons. My lab is across the city, near my home. Gather up your things, Linthus. We're on our way there right now. Linthus put her notebook and quill and ink back into her bag, which she slung over her shoulder as she flew up to speak eye to eye with Noraim. Is this task even possible, Master? Everything you have taught me until now is in contradiction to what the Brella desires. Yes, I know, but we must try, Noraim said impatiently. The Brella has ordered it, and no one can refuse or deny his command. Linthus knew he was right, for the power of a Theron official as high as the Brella was great and far-reaching. That must be why there were now two guards instead of just one posted at the door to Noraim's study. You remain here, the new guard ordered his comrade as the wizard and his apprentice came into the corridor. I'll accompany the wizard. Neither guard wore any emblem indicating that one might be of higher rank, but Linthus knew that her knowledge of the ways of the Theron military was limited. The one who had spoken immediately fell into step behind the wizard and the windling flying alongside him. With great formality of bearing, he followed the pair out of the building and into the streets of Vivane, leaving his comrade to guard an empty study. Twenty minutes later, Noraim, Linthus, and their escort arrived in the imperial quarter of the city, the section where the more important local Therans maintained their residences. Here was another shock. Linthus would never have dreamed that Noraim was ranked so high among the Therans, but then again, he was the best teacher in all of Vivane. They headed into the northernmost part of the quarter, and before long Noraim was leading Linthus up to the entrance of a small, nondescript old building. Approaching the door, the wizard spoke a command, and the door creaked open. "'This is the place?' Linthus asked incred incredulously. Noraim smiled at her reaction. "'Surprised, eh? Well, I grew up in this house, you see. My father built it one hundred and twenty years ago, when he and my mother first came from Thera. I know every crook, cranny, and brick of the building.' It's where I learned the art of wizardry, and where I still perform my most important work. This, too, came as a surprise to Linthus, and her face must have shown it. But surely you don't believe that all I do is teach you and a few others? I have my own research and study projects, and this is where I pursue them. Seeing Noraim's annoyance, Linthus realized that she really must learn to curb her tongue. A less patient master might have reprimanded or punished her severely for such an outburst. I apologize, master, she said contritely but all I've learned today has truly taken me by surprise. Noraim looked at her strangely, saying nothing. Then, as though he had suddenly changed his mind about something, Your apology is accepted, Linthus. It's true that I have no wish to call attention to my work. If I am successful as a wizard, it is because of results, not because I boast of my reputation. Linthus was somewhat embarrassed at having so underestimated or misjudged her teacher, but the sight of Noraim's laboratory confused her even more, Instead of a master wizard's workroom, the place was musty and strung with cobwebs, the floor uneven and made of blocks of roughly cut stone. Lining the walls were shelves stuffed to overflowing with ancient tomes, scrolls, and texts, and scattered across a large tabletop were jars and vials of all shapes and sizes. Linthus gaped in wonderment, but this time Noraim did not comment on either her surprise or her expression. Instead, he began to clear away the clutter of the table— Linthus went to help him, still reeling from the knowledge of how much more there was to Noraim than he'd ever let on before. The guard who had escorted them stationed himself outside the door as though the task of protecting this cobwebbed, book-filled chamber were the most natural duty in the world. A few minutes later, a knock at the door brought a messenger sent from the library to deliver a stack of heavy tomes and bound scrolls. At a nod from Noraim, the guard permitted the messenger entrance, then escorted the man to the table. The messenger let go his huge armful of books and scrolls, which rolled noisily onto the table, then turned to leave without uttering a single word. "'Let us start by considering the challenge before us,' Noraim said when the door had closed behind their visitor. Though somewhat unprepared to begin work so quickly, Linthus quickly gathered her wits about her. She set down her pack, then lighted on the edge of a chair, waiting expectantly while the wizard picked up a piece of chalk and began to write on the only wall not covered floor to ceiling with bookshelves. Our goal is to devise a spell, or to alter an existing spell, that when woven into the structure of an item we'll all be able to detect horrors. Now, Linthus, what are the ways by which we can detect astral presences? There's the astral sense spell, she said. The detect magic spell. Uh, the astral vision ability learned through the art of wizardry. Yes, yes, fine, those are all right. 
Noraim said absently, scrawling symbols for each one on the wall. Then he stood back and looked at his scribbles, apparently considering each in turn. As he did so, Linthus flew over to hover at shoulder level to her master. Paying her no heed, Noraim drew a symbol for the horrors and the basic symbols for an astral sensing spell. So, the spell has to filter all astral images and detect only those that are horror-tainted, he said. Then added a pregnant, Hmm. Is that possible? asked Linthus, but Noraim seemed to have completely forgotten her presence. Still lost in contemplation, the wizard crossed his arms inside the cuffs of his wide-sleeved robe while gazing off at a point somewhere far beyond the wall. Now that we know our goal, we can move on. And we're going to have to break the rules. Break the rules? Linthus echoed. Again, Noraim seemed oblivious to her interruption. An item such as the one requested by the Brella goes against all the magical theory and knowledge I know. He was quiet again while he studied the symbols he'd just written in chalk. Yes, he said finally. We must create a new item, one that can detect the presence of horrors and their creations, and with a range great enough to provide adequate warning time in which to prepare a defense. The other problem is that the Brella is not trained in the use of magic. He's a diplomat, not an adept who can cast a spell. Linthus still hovered in the air near Noraim, who suddenly turned his head to look at her. It occurs to me that we have two basic challenges, he told her. First, we must alter an astral sensing spell so that it is much more finely tuned, allowing more detail to be gleaned from a target pattern. And second, the spell must somehow be able to detect not only horrors, but even small traces of horror tainting in the subject. I'd like you to begin work on the second problem while I tackle the first. Among the texts I had delivered are a number of scrolls devoted to detection magic and also to the magic of the horrors. Take those home and study them. It'll take you at least two days to read all the information, not to mention trying to draw any conclusions from it. Return in three days. Noraim went back to the table where he drew three small scrolls from the pile left there by the messenger. These three should be of help. And please, don't forget to take notes. Consider this project part of your lessons, which, by the way, we will hold here for the next few weeks. You will come here instead of to my study. I'll instruct the guards to admit you, but only on those days we are to meet. Should you come on any other day, the guards will not let you pass. Linthus obediently took the scrolls and found a sack big enough to hold them safely. Then she also picked up her own pack and flew out the door, heading for home. Three days later, she returned to Noraim's lab. In that time, Linthus had learned more than she'd ever thought possible about detection magic, and even more about the magic of horrors. For it was this latter aspect of the research that fascinated her. She, like everyone in Thera, or all of Barsave for that matter, had been warned of the terrible powers of the horrors and of the unspeakable acts of which they were capable. By studying the magic of the horrors, would it be possible to find a weakness that would allow the Therans to defeat the foul creatures before the outbreak of the Scourge? Surely others must have had that same thought. Was it not through study of the Books of Harrow that the rites of protection and passage had been created? As Linthus entered the lab, Noraim lifted his head sharply, obviously more than a little angry at her tardiness. You're late, he barked. Only by a few minutes, Master. I, I was not certain how much time to allow. I will tolerate no excuses. I instructed you to come here for your lessons, and you are late. Please excuse me, Master. The way here was longer than I remembered. I became so engrossed in my studies that I didn't allow myself sufficient time for the trip. It will not happen again. It best not. Now, tell me what you have learned with all this eager study. Linthus began to unpack her things, retrieving her notebook, which contained her notes from the last three days of reading and reflection. She was still a bit taken aback by Noreen's sharpness. She had been late so many times before, but never had he scolded her in an anger, and never had he ordered her to do anything. As she flew over to Noreen with notebook in hand, Linthus noticed the wall where the other day he had written down the goals and challenges of their task. Those scribbles had now been erased and replaced with the signs for a spell pattern of some sort. A detection spell from the looks of it, but not one familiar to Linthus. As Linthus opened her notebook to the most recently written pages, she and Noraim began discussing the hows and whys of detection magic, starting with the basics of pattern recognition, and leading eventually to more complicated theories of variations in patterns. Don't most detection magics rely on a variation of the astral sense spell to view the pattern of an object or being? Linthus said. If the pattern seen matches the type the spell is designed to detect, it will trigger a warning of some kind. Noraim nodded his head. Yes, but those spells are crude. 
able to penetrate only the grossest level of patterns. There's a second, more refined method of viewing patterns, a natural ability known only to the members of your own race. You mean the Windling's astral sight, Linthus said. Well, yes, there is that, but no other name given race has it, and no one has ever been able to duplicate it through a talent or a spell, have they, Master? Not that I know of. Still, we must take account of it as a method that exists, said the wizard. But it's not one that can be harnessed, Linthus insisted. Shouldn't we concentrate on what is possible and not what isn't? Even as she said the words, she expected a reprimand. Her habit of expressing whatever was on her mind was lately bringing her grief. It was a hard habit to break, and she prepared herself for correction. But none came. You're right, was all Noraim said. We should focus on what we can do. But also remember this. That which was impossible yesterday is likely today. The research into the workings of magic brings new understandings every day. We should not close our eyes to what is possible or impossible, for we may unlock new secrets at any time. Yes, master, Linthus murmured, but Noraim had barely stopped to take a breath. I think we both agree that constructing a spell that will detect horrors is relatively simple. Their patterns are so rough and scabrous that a detection spell relying on astral sense would suffice. The difficulty will come in trying to create a spell that can detect those things in beings that are merely horror-corrupted. We're like a weaponsmith who studies the pattern of a sword to determine its true nature. He notices the minute details in the weapon's pattern, and it is those details that carry the weapon's uniqueness. In theory, we should be able to do the same to detect uniquenesses that are the result of a horror taint, Noraim said. What do you mean in theory, Master? The works I've been studying imply that such an approach should work. Well... Suffice it to say that I believe the variations between a natural and a corrupted pattern might be too subtle for detection by a spell using astral sensing. Besides, maybe there is no single unique difference for all horror corruptions. No. In order for the spell to be truly effective, we must build astral, physical, and historical knowledge about horrors into it. What we need is a spell that can detect variations at the subtlest level and then determine if those variations are the results of horror corruption. So, Noreen went on, we will have to carry out some experiments. Return again in two days while I give this matter some thought. And do be on time. Linthus was pleased, but puzzled. Do you mean we will continue to study the problem of using detection magic? No, we will not. I will continue on that problem. You will focus on other areas. In the meantime, I will be attempting to devise a spell pattern that satisfies our needs. Now, be on your way. Uh, and Linthus? Yes, sir. Be on time. Yes, Master Norim. Are there any other materials you would like me to study? No, but if you wish to do some more reading, take one of those scrolls. Norim pointed to a small pile on the table. I won't be needing them yet. After glancing through the stack, Linthus chose another on the subject of horror magic. Then she put her notebook, quill, and ink into her pack. Two days hence, she said, rising into the air. On time. Two days later, as Linthus neared Noraim's lab, she thought about all that had been happening recently. One day she'd been an apprentice to the wizard Noraim, the next she was a servant girl to an irascible, overbearing tyrant. What had happened? Noraim had never before displayed the arrogance of air of superiority most Therans wore so proudly. Perhaps it was true what they said in Barsave, once a Theron, forever a Theron. The scrolls she'd been studying lately all dealt with nethermancy. Specifically, horror-related nethermancy. Over the past few days, her fascination with horror magic and the nature of horrors had been growing, so much so that Linthus wondered more than once why she hadn't pursued the discipline of nethermancy instead of wizardry. Then she would dismiss the thought almost as quickly as it came, remembering that wizardry was the master magician discipline, the one dealing with the nature of magic, not spirits or elements or illusion, but with magic itself. Suddenly it struck her that this was not her own belief, but the words her parents had spoken in trying to encourage or perhaps force her to embrace the path of wizardry. One way or another, now was not the moment to consider a change. As she approached Noraim's house, Linthus saw more guards now on duty outside the door. It had made her uneasy enough just having one there, and now there were three. Either the Brella had ordered stronger security, or something significant had occurred. She hurried to the door and was admitted by the usual guard. The other two seemed not to be watching the door, but instead waiting for something. As she flew past, Linthus noted that the two new men wore the uniforms of guards from the slave camps of Vivain. Why would such as these have come to Noraim's lab? she wondered. But the answer wasn't long in coming. 
When she entered the lab, she immediately saw a female dwarf seated on a long wooden bench, her hands and feet shackled together. She wore ragged, dirty clothing and had the skeletal look of the malnourished. Next to the slave were two additional pairs of shackles, both empty. Linthus wondered why that was so as she made her way into the room. This was not, of course, Linthus's first exposure to slavery. Growing up Theron and the child of fair-to-do parents, she'd always seen slaves about the house. It was true that her parents always referred to them as servants, yet everyone knew they were slaves. Perhaps it was some windling cord deep in her soul, but she'd always recoiled instinctively at the idea of the ownership of one being by another. If the universe had truly created the name-givers, as she had been taught, then the idea of superiority of one over another must be false. Linthus had always kept these thoughts to herself, however, for such a viewpoint was unacceptable for a Theron. Instead, she had pretended to accept and approve of the practice. Moving past the slave, Linthus could not help but wince at her condition. Did Noraim notice her reaction? Perhaps not, for the wizard made no comment as Linthus flew over to the table to unpack her things. She could see that he had been scribbling on the wall again. For one thing, the spell pattern she'd noticed earlier had grown in complexity and size. The other change was that one portion of the wall was filled with many symbols, ranging from a symbol for subject to one that completely eluded her. Linthus didn't have time to consider what it all meant. The instant her tiny feet touched down softly on the table, Noraim turned to her. "'Glad to see that you're on time today,' was all the wizard said. "'I was just about to begin an important experiment.' Linthus didn't answer immediately, for she suddenly recognized the symbol that had puzzled her at first. It was one used often in spells of blood magic. She turned to look at Noraim, hovering at eye level as she spoke. "'What is the nature of the experiment, Master?' "'I've been testing out a theory,' Noraim said, pointing to a plain ring lying on the workbench. "'I've placed an enhanced matrix into this ring and attuned the matrix for an astral sense spell, but the pattern of the matrix is of a varied sort. See for yourself.' Linthus looked down at the ring. Using her astral vision, she peered into the ring, then into its pattern, and then deeper into its pattern until she saw the astral representation of the matrix. Truly, it was unlike any she had ever seen. The matrix had a stronger pattern than most, but that was not all. One small area separate from the main pattern was particularly powerful. That must be where the spell thread was stored, Linthus thought. But even that was odd, for a single thread connecting to nowhere dangled loosely from the area. As Linthus followed the path of the thread, she noted that it wove itself into the small thread storage area and threw that into the heart of the matrix. She returned her sight to normal and looked up at the wizard. "'This work is most interesting, Master, but to what purpose will you turn it?' asked the windling. "'I'm attempting to find a way to enhance the ability of an astral sense spell to make it rival your astral sight in terms of clarity and precision.' "'But how?' Linthus blurted, interrupting. Noraim looked at her sharply, but merely resumed where he'd left off. I thought that if an astral sense spell were infused with the power of blood magic, it might serve the purpose. Blood magic? Linthus squeaked out as the slave inhaled sharply. Yes, blood magic. It's nothing evil, you know. It's just a little more, how should you say, grisly than some other forms of magic. It occurred to me that what gives a windling's astral sight such precision is that it is guided by a life force. By using blood magic to guide an astral sense spell, I'm hoping to achieve a like effect. Now, you will draw a bit of Neriana's blood while I activate the spell within the ring. While doing so, observe with your astral vision and tell me what you see. Noraim turned to the dwarf woman sitting on the bench and summoned her over. Seeing the fear on the slave's face, Linthus tried to calm her even while placing the ring on her finger. Don't worry, she said gently. I'm only going to prick your finger slightly with the stagger. It won't hurt at all. I, uh, uh, it's not the pain, it's the blood magic. It's the work of the horrors. Oh, no, no, Linthus told her soothingly. As Norim said, it's not evil. Linthus's attempt at reassurance seemed futile. The woman was frightened, and no pretty words from her captors were going to relieve her. Linthus held Neriana's hand in readiness while Norim wove the spell thread into the matrix, then cast the spell. While doing so, he signaled to Linthus, who pricked Neriana's finger at exactly the moment the spell was cast. Just before Linthus shifted to astral vision, she noticed the ring absorbing the drop of blood, a sign that the blood magic had been activated. Seeing astrally, Linthus focused again on the pattern of the ring and of the matrix and the loose thread. This time, however, her vision was distorted by Neriana's pattern, making accurate observation difficult. Looking more closely, she saw the thread pulse with the energy given it by Noraim. 
The thread thrashed wildly, like an angry snake lashing out in search of something. Now Linthus saw the thread move toward Nariana's pattern, its thrashing becoming less intense as it neared a new power source. And then, quick as thought, and almost too quickly for Linthus to see, the thread attached itself to Nariana's pattern. At that instant, the thread pulsed with energy as Nariana's pattern waned. Linthus quickly switched to normal vision, only to see Nariana visibly grow weaker before her eyes. It was not the first time Linthus had worked with blood magic or witnessed its effects, but never had she seen anything like this. True, blood magic always drained the subject, but not to such an extent. As Linthus watched Nariana growing weaker, the dwarf woman stared back, too terrified even to speak. Nariana, can you sense the astral presences in this room? Noraim asked. The woman shook her head, but Linthus couldn't be sure whether it was in response to the question or another effect of the experiment. Nariana, do you sense anything? Anything at all? Noraim demanded. It's killing her, Linthus hissed. We've got to take the ring off. She can hold on a few moments more. Nariana, you must sense something. Nariana nodded and pointed to a small ceramic jar on the workbench. See, it's working, Noraim exclaimed excitedly. I placed a minor spell on that jar as a test. She can sense it. It's working. No, she's dying, Linthus wailed. I've got to remove the ring right now. Noraim drew himself up to his full height. You will leave that ring where it is, and that is an order. Nariana, do you sense anything else? This time, the woman only shook. Not just her head, but her whole body convulsed as though quivering with the cold. But, Linthus began plaintively. Norim's voice was cold, emotionless. Don't, or you will truly anger me. Linthus stared helplessly at Nariana, watching the very life drain out of her. Even in her worst nightmares, Linthus had never seen anything like this. Before her eyes, the magic needed to power a simple spell was killing a woman. Even as she watched, the dwarf woman grew so weak that she seemed to lack even the energy to be afraid. The tension in her face relaxed as her body used every last bit of energy trying to hang on to life. And then, in the way Linthus knew it would end, Nariana's eyes closed and her body went limp as the last drops of life force were drained away. Knowing the truth, but committed to verifying it, Linthus switched back to her astral vision just in time to see the dwarf woman's pattern fade to nothing, followed immediately by the pattern of the Matrix in the ring. As it too vanished, Linthus closed her eyes for a few moments before opening them to the physical world. "'How could you let her die?' she spat out. "'You killed her just for some experiment!' Noraim didn't answer immediately, looking almost bemused as he studied the windling's tiny face, almost as though he were taking her measure. That best be the last time you question me, Windling, the wizard said coldly. Yes, the slave is dead. The sun will still rise tomorrow, as it will set, and you and I will still be tasked with finding a workable solution. Nothing of importance has changed. Linthus couldn't believe her ears. This was her teacher, Noraim ever thought, talking about the sacrifice of a life as though it were no more than swatting a fly. What baffles me, the wizard continued, is why she died. The magic needed to power such a spell is minor, ne nearly insignificant. It had drained the slave of her life. But that isn't the way our spell magic works, Linthus said heatedly, lifting into the air, too agitated to remain earthbound. The energy for spells, for all magic, comes from astral space, not from us. The power of astral space is infinite, beyond us to understand. Even the most powerful rituals can't drain the endless resources of astral space. But that doesn't mean that people can provide that much power. Oh, yes, of course. The blood made the spell draw solely on Nariana as the source of its energy. No person could withstand it. Noraim sighed as he looked at the limp form of Nariana. The biggest disappointment is that the experiment failed. But I suppose that really isn't so important. The Brella wouldn't have used it even if it had worked. Why's that? Because the Brella does not, how shall I say, approve of blood magic. Like so many people, he believes that blood magic was brought to our world by the horrors. Silly premise, I know, but the man will not listen to reason. Linthus was very careful not to raise her voice this time. Noraim didn't usually mind questions so long as they were in pursuit of knowledge and understanding. Do you mean to say that you knew the Brella wouldn't have accepted a solution that would require his using blood magic, and yet you continued with the experiment? I don't understand. It's all part of the research, the search for knowledge, for an understanding of how magic can be used in ways not yet known. 
Surely you too wished to know whether the experiment would work or not. Yes, but we might have stopped it before she died. Perhaps. But do you place the value of a slave's life over the search for truth? Over our successful completion of this project? Perhaps I've not made myself clear, Linthus. This work is now your priority, period. You study what I order you to study. You do not question my actions or my orders. Do you understand? Yes, Master, I understand. Linthus remained quiet while Noraim fixed her with his unyielding gaze. From the look on his face, Linthus saw how seriously the wizard was now taking this project. She asked him what they were to do next. First, we clean up this mess, he said, and rang for the guards, who arrived immediately to remove the lifeless body and all other traces of the slave woman's existence from the room. When they were done, Noraim sat down at the table and Linthus perched near him. You've been reading a good deal of material pertaining to the horrors and their magic, have you not? Yes, master, and it's fascinating, but the more I learn, the more questions I have, and the more I want to know. Noreim smiled at her for the first time in a long time. <laughs> How well I know the feeling. The blessing and the curse of all wizards. Our discipline is one of knowledge, and I can only tell you that the time, that the yearning for knowledge does not lessen with time. No, if anything, it grows even stronger with the passing years. For now, take this text home and read it. At our next meeting, we will begin to define exactly how to mold our spell to seek out only horrors. Before I go, can you tell me what this is? Linthus asked as she flew over to the wall. That is the beginning of what could very well be our spell pattern. A variant of the Astral Sense spell, one allowing for greater range and duration. As he spoke, Noraim walked over to the equations and pointed out portions of the pattern, areas that Linthus was only now noticing as being incomplete. Here is where I hope to weave in a method of identifying horror magic so that the spell will recognize horrors and their magic. But what is this over here? asked Linthus, indicating yet another incomplete area of the spell pattern. That is where I shall weave the triggering and power for the spell. Today's results have given me some ideas, but I must think further on it. Now, Linthus, it is time for you to go. I bid you good day. Good day, master, Linthus replied, flying over to pick up her pack before going out the door. If earlier she had been confused, now she was completely baffled. The extent to which Noraim would go in pursuit of his ends was truly mind-numbing. But even more disturbing was knowing that he was right. The thirst for knowledge was strong in her, and yes, she felt it growing. Even as she'd watched the life being sucked out of Neriana, Linthus had been aware of feeling almost as much curiosity as horror. Curiosity about the outcome. Yes, she'd wanted to stop the experiment, but... Deep down, she'd also wanted to know whether it would work, whether it would kill Neriana or simply drain her to unconsciousness. And no matter how much remorse Linthus felt at the wasteful death, she also realized that had Neriana lived, she would always have wondered. Preoccupied with these disturbing thoughts, Linthus flew on home, knowing that now she would have to live with the knowledge of what she had become. When the guard admitted Linthus into Noraim's lab several days later, the wizard was not there to greet her. She had arrived early instead of just on time, but she'd expected to find Noraim already at work. While unpacking her bag, she glanced over at the table that held the books Noraim was using for his research, which reminded her of the text she'd been reading just last night. It was a treatise on the scholarly aspects of nethermancy, specifically the nethermantic view of magical theory. The book also contained extensive material on the horrors, which was becoming for Linthus an obsession. Ever since beginning this new project with Noraim, she'd studied and learned more than she'd ever imagined possible about the horrors, and still she wanted to know more. After setting her things on the table, Linthus flew over to the wall to see what new changes had occurred. The spell pattern seemed to have grown yet again. Upon closer examination, she realized that it hadn't actually changed so much as simply been rewritten much larger than before. Linthus guessed that Noraim had done so to give himself more room to expand the spell pattern, which now covered nearly the entire wall. Linthus removed the nethermancy text from her pack and flew over to the table. She put back the scroll she'd borrowed and began to look for another, the next stop in her journey toward knowledge of the horrors. As she searched through the pile, Linthus wondered about the impressive new book that had appeared on the table slightly to one side. As she hovered in the air to read the book's title, the nature of name-givers, an uneasy feeling began to come over her. Linthus had no idea where this book had come from or for what purpose. It was here in Noraim's lab. 
Several scraps of paper poked out from various spots in the book, presumably to mark pages of importance. Taking hold of four or five pages at a time, Linthus had to give a strong pull with both hands and then fly in a slight arc back toward the front cover of the book in order to turn the heavy parchment pages to the first one marked. The top of that page was headed Windlings, but she decided not to stop there. Again taking another four or five pages in her hands and giving a heft before rising into the air, Linthus continued in this manner until she got to the second marked page. This one was headed Windling Sight and was a treatise on the astral vision with which all windlings were endowed at birth. The essay explained that, though many researchers had tried to duplicate or extract this ability, none had ever succeeded. The ability was native to windling physiology and could not be reproduced by another race. Reading this, Linthus remembered Noraim's mention of her astral vision when they had first discussed how their astral detector might function. She had dismissed the idea because she knew, as this book confirmed, that it was impossible for any but a windling to produce the ability. But perhaps Noreen wasn't convinced, or was looking for ways to improve the astral sense spell, as he always liked to remind her, what is impossible today is likely tomorrow. So engrossed was Linthus in her thoughts that, she sound, that the sound of voices made her jump. She flew quickly away back to her usual place just as someone appeared in the doorway. It was the Theron guard pushing the door open for Noreen, who followed behind, carrying an armful of books. "'Well, well, Linthus, early today, I see,' he said amiably enough. "'Good.' I do hope you've calmed down regarding our recent experiments. I'm sure you realize now they were necessary. Linthus thought it best not to respond, letting Noraim think as he would. She could barely have explained to herself her confused and contradictory reaction to the work of her previous visit. I'll take your silence as either a yes or to mean you're not sure how to respond. In either case, we shall now move on to another experiment. The wizard walked over to the table, setting his books down near the one on windling magic that Linthus had left open in her haste. Silently, she cursed herself for not remembering to close it. I see you've been looking through this book. Fascinating, isn't it? We may study the ways of magic forever, yet never unlock the secrets possessed naturally by the various name-giver races. The descriptions of what you windlings see through your astral vision have intrigued me mightily. Linthus was trying to conceal her relief that Noraim didn't mind her prying, when suddenly two pairs of Theron soldiers entered the room, each carrying a long, narrow box. Both boxes were made of a deep red wood, the corners and edges lined with finely polished metal guards. Along one side was a set of three hinges, and along the other were three clasps, but it was there the similarities ended. The first box was rather plain in appearance. Though finely made, it was more functional than beautiful. The other was quite ornate. At first, Linthus couldn't tell the nature of the carvings that covered all sides of the second box, but looking closer, she saw that they were runic in nature. Not language runes or decorative runes, but horror ward runes, the same as those found at the entrances to the underground cares and on the domes of citadels being built all across Barsave in preparation for the coming scourge. When she turned her astral vision to the box, her suspicions were confirmed. The box held powerful magic, protective magic, specifically formed to resist horrors in their magic. The runic patterns she saw were very similar to those reproduced in several of the books she'd recently been reading. "'What are these?' she asked. "'The reason for my delay,' said Noraim. "'I had to convince the Brella to let me remove these from the treasury for our work today. His obsessive fear of the horrors in their power made him reluctant, but when I explained that I would need these to complete his device to detect horrors, he eventually agreed.' They must be returned within three hours, which does not leave us much time at all. What are they? Linthus wanted to know, feeling excitement and curiosity already beginning to build. If we are to study the different ways the magic of our world and that of the horrors is perceived astrally, we must have some test items. These are two magical swords. One's magic is what we might call natural. Its pattern is developed and evolved through the events in which the weapon is participated. It is named and holds magical knowledge. The magic of the second sword is horror magic. When the blade was first brought to the city, the Brella knew not what to do with it and had this box built to contain the horror's power. We will examine each, first separately, then side by side, to determine the best way to detect horror magic. Are you ready? Yes, Linthus said eagerly. Good. Then let us begin with the natural magic weapon. Linthus turned and noticed that the two boxes now lay on the floor of the lab, close to the spot where Nariana had died yesterday. As she began to focus her attention, Noraim walked over to the unmarked box, opened the three clasps, and lifted the top. Inside the box was a large sword, a broadsword. 
Noraim then walked over to Linthus, who stood on a table. Now, he said, let us each cast an astral sense spell and see what we see. They both cast the spell and peered into the sword. As the spell took effect, the sword's pattern began to form in their mind's eye. In their studies, Linthus and Noraim had done this many, many times before, when the wizard was instructing the windling how to search for knowledge held within a pattern. As you view the sword's pattern, try to commit it to memory, he said, for we must study the contrasts between the two kinds of patterns. Only after we understand the differences can we begin to work toward pinpointing horror magic amid all the other types. As Noraim spoke his instructions, Linthus tried to memorize the image before her. The pattern was triangular in shape, with each side consisting of a blade woven from what looked like spell threads. The threads emerged from either end of a blade and swirled into a spiral pattern that filled the interior of the triangle. The swirls were mesmerizing, seeming to be in constant motion, and reminded Linthus of spells and illusions used by illusionists when trying to hypnotize a subject. After committing what she could to memory, she made the image fade from view, fearing that she would indeed become mesmerized if she watched it much longer. Now, use your astral vision, Noraim told her, and do the same again. After clearing her mind, Linthus tuned her astral vision on the pattern. This time, she was able to see it much more clearly. The pattern's shape was still triangular, and the blades were still there, but now she could also see that her earlier perceptions had been more accurate than she'd thought. The threads that wove in and out of the blades were, in fact, moving. She could watch them move through the spirals in the middle, into the pommel of the blade, and then emerge back into the spirals from the tip of the blade. As she looked, she saw what seemed like thousands of these threads working their way through the pattern. It was the first time she had ever compared what she saw with her spell for astral sensing and what she saw with her astral vision. The difference was astounding. The pattern had come to life before her astral eyes with an engrossing clarity and detail. She continued to stare at the sword with such intensity that she didn't hear Noraim telling her to stop. It was only when he closed the box holding the sword that she was startled back into the physical world. I'm sorry, Master. I was captivated. Did you see it? I've never seen so clearly before. Well, this is the most powerful item I've used with you, so that may be part of why you were so entranced. Did I see what? The pattern. It was alive. It was moving. Constantly. You didn't notice? No, I suppose I didn't. Remember that the ability learned through a discipline is much less powerful than your natural one. Tell me, Linthus, what did you see? Describe both. Linthus described as best she could the appearance of the pattern under both conditions. As she did, the two of them wrote notes, she in her book, Noraim in his, and on one of them, one of the few clean spots on the wall. A few minutes later, they were ready to examine the horror-tainted sword. Noraim called a pair of guards into the room as he went over to the rune-covered box. "'We will be studying this in a way that will blind us to what is occurring around us,' he told the guards. "'You two will observe both of us and this sword,' and close the box immediately if anything untoward occurs. Do you understand? Yes, sir, said the two in unison, as though they had done so hundreds of times before, which, thought Linthris, they probably had. Such was the life of the Theron military. While the guards were taking up positions on either side of the two wizards, Noraim undid the clasps and lifted the lid. Inside was another broadsword, this one almost evil-looking. Its blade was marked with some of the same runes Linthus had seen in the books she'd been reading about horrors. A quick look at the runes revealed that they told a short history of the blade, its creator, its patron horror, and its first wielder. Linthus stopped herself before she could read the runes too closely, preferring to remain innocent of the weapon's knowledge. Ready? said Noraim. Cast your spell. Each of the two wizards again cast the spell for astral sensing, then peered into the open box to view the weapon's pattern beginning to form in their mind's eye. The pattern was very much like the other swords, but also very different. Where the first glowed with a yellow tint, the tone of this one was much darker, barely luminescent. The pattern pulsed more than glowed. Its pattern was also triangular in shape, but the sides were corpses instead of blades. Again, these were comprised of threads that wove through the bodies and into the middle of the triangle. Here was another difference. This pattern had no spirals at all, Instead, the interior of the triangle was filled with a mass of tangled threads, all interweaving in a chaotic fashion that made closer examination impossible. The other difference was that this pattern had depth. The other pattern had appeared as a flat triangle that Linthus saw as though from above. The horror-tainted pattern was not flat, but seemed to be formed from three triangles, which together formed a pyramid-like shape. 
Each triangle was the same as the others, and all three shared the tangled, chaotic interior. Before forcing the spell to fade, Linthus tried to commit this image to memory, as she had the previous one, that she might describe it to Noraim. But as the pattern began to fade from her perception, she thought she saw it looking back at her. This shocking sensation snapped her immediately back to the real world, where Noraim sat shaking his head, as though trying to dislodge something from his mind. If that is the form of the horrors, we truly do have much to fear, was all he said. Noraim was obviously disturbed by what he had seen. The first time Linthus had ever witnessed the wizard less than in full control. Of course, it was not a common experience to stare into the pattern of a horror-tainted sword. Though both had seen horror-tainted patterns before, it had never been under such conditions. Odd that the shape was so different this time, Noraim said finally, still looking somewhat dazed. The star-shaped pattern was more convoluted than the triangle, don't you think? But I saw only a triangular pattern, Master. Three-sided to form a pyramid. Noraim shook his head in puzzlement. I saw a six-pointed star. Its sides were made of crisscrossings of severed limbs. Perhaps the pattern is perceived differently by each person who views it. Maybe each of us saw a different portion of the pattern, each section revealing less than the whole? Perhaps. But before we begin to theorize, let us continue with the next part, shall we? Linthus braced herself for what was to come. To see this horror pattern with as much clarity as she'd seen the other one might be too much. Again, she tuned her astral vision toward the pattern and gazed upon it. It was just as she suspected. The shape of the pattern was the same, only much clearer. The corpses were not dead, but were instead living bodies confined to endless torment. The threads that moved through the pattern were blood-red and much more distinct. The shape was also more defined, the pyramid easier to distinguish. It was inverted, as before, the apex pointing downward, but by far the most unusual difference was in the pattern's interior. The threads that made up the pattern were just as tangled, but where before they were chaotic, now they seemed to follow some form of sub-pattern, as though within the patterns of the item was another pattern, much weaker but still present. Linthus peered more deeply into the pattern in hopes of recognizing this new sub-pattern. As she drew her vision closer, she began to see the form in the pyramid's interior. Stop her! Grab her! The pattern seemed to contain a face. Get over there! Linthus, what are you doing? The face seemed to be speaking to her, calling her name. Close the box, you idiot! It's taking control of her! She drew nearer and nearer to the face and began to reach out for it when suddenly her vision was abruptly cut off. In place of the face, all she saw were protection runes. She snapped out of astral sight, shocked to see where she was. She was hovering mere inches from the box, her arm extended toward the sword, which one of the guards was holding. The other guard had drawn his own sword and had pointed it at her. Noraim knelt on the floor on the other side of the box, still in the act of closing the clasps. What happened? You began to fly toward the sword. As you got closer, you reached out as if to touch it. Didn't you hear me shouting? The guards had to subdue you while I closed the box. What did you see in there? I thought I saw it the first time, but I wasn't sure. There was a face inside the pattern. It called out to me. I tried to get a closer look, and as I drew near, I wanted an even closer look. It was... As though the more I learned, the more I was compelled to get closer, so I could learn yet more. I might have reached it if you hadn't stopped me. My thanks. Certainly. Couldn't have you possessed now, could we? Noraim's attempt at humor was lost on Linthus. Aside from her fear about what had just happened, she was still facing the tip of a sword while being held motionless. Do you mind putting that down? I'm fine. Oh, yes, uh, release her, Noraim ordered the guards, and send these back to the Brella. We won't be needing them any more today. What about the side-by-side -side comparison? asked Linthus. After what just happened, I think we've done enough for one day. Yes, she said weakly. I know it's unpleasant, but can you tell me what you saw the f this last time? We need to determine the differences between the two. Oh, yes, easily. The first was static, the second was dynamic. The horror pattern pulsed with energy. It was as if there was a horror living in the pattern. Well, that is possible. Of course, after all the studying I've been doing this past week, you'd think I'd have been smarter. It's possible the sword is horror-marked. That would allow the horror to notice us as we studied it, and try to use its powers through the sword. You should recommend that the sword be destroyed. But has been attempted with no success. Now, 
As I began to say, it is possible that a horror is within the sword, but your theory may be more sound. If a horror were within the sword, it would have succeeded in getting whatever it wanted of you. Yes, said Linthus, then continued describing the horror pattern to Noraim, how the pattern had depth and how it seemed to be aware of their presence while the other sword pattern had simply existed. After she finished and had begun to jot a few notes in her book, Noraim sat thinking for a time. It might be that your knowledge of the horrors that allowed you to see the things more clearly than I. You've been studying the subject quite deeply, have you not? As he so often did, Noraim almost seemed to be talking more to himself than to Linthus, for he didn't await her response. That must be a key to solving this puzzle. Somehow we must find a way to weave horror knowledge into the pattern of the spell, as well as give it the necessary clarity of sight to see deep into the pattern. That way, the spell can determine whether or not the astral images it detects are, in fact, horror-tainted. Noreem sat thinking for another brief while, and Linthus didn't interrupt his thoughts. The idea that a horror is either within the sword or is in contact with it has given me an idea. What if a life force of some sort could be placed within the item? Perhaps the life force could be attuned or trained in horror knowledge, which would let it detect the subtleties of horror taint? But our early experiment showed that we can't use the wearer as a power source. It would kill the person almost instantly, protested Linthus. The spell thread attached itself to Neriana, and the spell drew its power from her instead of from astral space in the normal way. That's what killed her. The idea is to have a life force inside the item that can create a pattern thread, not a spell thread that attaches to the wearer. This thread is like those used to connect the patterns of people with those of magical items and such. The item is powered through the wearer, not by the wearer, much like magic weapons. Are you sure? I mean, I mean, how can we get a life force inside an item? Is there magic that can do that? Noreim turned toward Linthus with a perplexed look. Not sure. I must think on this. There may be a way, but... But what? Ah, not of your concern. We're done for today. Go on home now, Linthus. We'll meet again in three days, at which time we will discuss how to alter the astral sensing spell to seek out only the magic of horrors. We are sort of at time, but I'm gonna... We've got another about ten pages, so we'll... Finish this up to wrap up our day here. As Linthus... As Linthus flew toward Noraim's lab three days later, she replayed some of the last few meetings in her mind as a way of cementing what she had learned. It had been difficult for her. The experiments and research they were doing were much more advanced than anything she'd ever previously encountered. Noraim didn't always explain to her all the details and fine distinctions he apparently gained from each of their meetings, which made Linthus feel that it must be because her teacher didn't consider her competent enough for the project. Yet, he'd been the one to request her assistance, so he must have some degree of trust in her abilities. Reviewing the discussions and experiments that she and Noraim had undertaken most recently, Linthus began to realize how limited had been her role. While she had been focusing nearly all her efforts on studying nethermancy and horror magic, Noraim was progressing in a rather haphazard fashion. He would address one topic, conduct an experiment, and then proceed to the next with no logical connection. To Linthus, it seemed that they had made little or no real progress toward creating an item that could detect horrors in their constructs. Noraim had apparently succeeded in altering the astral sense spell to give it extended range and duration, but that was only a small part of the challenge. As Linthus was mulling this over, she realized that the oddest part of all was that Noraim seemed content with his progress. He didn't behave as though he were feeling any pressure, but more as though they were right on schedule. But how could that be? When Linthus flew through the door to the lab, she found Noraim scribbling notes into his large book, and one where he recorded his students' progress and accomplishments. As she glided toward the table where he sat, she saw that the spell pattern scrawled on the wall had grown yet again. This time, a portion of it flowed from the wall down onto the floor, wrapping itself around the area where both the blood magic experiment and the horror-tainted sword viewing had taken place. Noraim noticed the windling observing the spell pattern scrawled across the wall and floor. I see that you've noticed the alterations I've made to the astral scent spell. Only a few more and I think it'll be finished. I didn't realize you had progressed so far so soon, Master. How close are you? Closer than you might imagine. As she drew out her notebook, Noraim began to discuss the nature of spell patterns and how they might be altered or manipulated. 
Then he stood up and walked across the room to where he'd been writing the spell pattern on the wall. As far as Linthus could tell, the writing was now more a mass of symbols than anything else, perhaps because she couldn't see the entire pattern. Aside from the portion that had spread to the floor, another part was covered by a cloth hanging from a hook on the ceiling. Linthus knew it might get her into trouble, but she had to ask about the hidden portion of the pattern. What's behind that cloth there? Nothing for you to concern yourself with. But if it's part of the spell pattern, I need to see it, don't I? Noraim was obviously irritated by her persistence and responded in kind. I said, it is not your business. Do not be concerned about it. But don't I need to see the spell pattern before we can begin to... The wizard pointed one finger at her and spoke a single word, giving Linthus no chance to react to his spell. Its magic struck her in an instant, holding her fast, frozen in place. That will be all from you. I said it was none of your concern, and it is certainly not your place to question me in this matter. What I do and how I perform my research are my concern alone. Do you understand? Linthus could neither nod, speak, nor gesture. She was held motionless, forced to watch and listen to Noraim's chastising. Good. It would be unfortunate for me to lose my temper with you. Now then. As quickly as he had cast the spell, Noraim released it. In the ten seconds that the spell had held her, Linthus had been unable to move or speak or even breathe. Her every bodily function was frozen in time. I... I apologize, but... Up till now I have been patient with you, Noraim said quietly. At the time of your last outburst, I gave you a warning. Do not question me again. I do not make threats lightly, and you would be well advised not to push me further. Linthus held her tongue, fearing she might say something she would regret. She nodded and flew over to the wall with all the writing on it. As she did, Noraim began to explain the alterations of the astral sense spell that he'd written all across the wall and on the floor of the lab. Look at the pattern of this spell. As you can see, the range and duration are greater, and the effect of the spell is now much stronger than any other like it. Now, do you think we can further alter the pattern so that it only detects horrors and horror-tainted magic? Linthus looked hard at the spell pattern that lay sprawled out before her. She also saw the spell's pattern in her mind's eye as she attempted to visualize how best to change the pattern. Though such a task was not usually too difficult, this most recent confrontation with Noraim was weighing on her mind, and she was frightened of the anger he'd displayed just moments ago. She had known Noraim was powerful, but had never been the target of his power. She suddenly realized just how lucky she was to still be alive. As she stared at the spell pattern, using both her normal vision and her mind's eye, Linthus noticed that the portions of the pattern Noraim had pointed out were not simply expanded, but were, in fact, enhanced, strengthened by the knowledge of how magic works to pinpoint astral presences. As she found herself becoming absorbed in her own thoughts, she gained an even deeper understanding of the truth behind the phrase, knowledge is power. Noraim's knowledge of how magic functioned in the world had enabled him to improve this spell far beyond anything she'd have imagined possible. And then, as Linthus stared into the pattern, she understood that her original ideas were inferior to those her teacher had used to create this new spell. At once, she spoke up. No, I, I don't think we can alter the pattern, but perhaps we could weave knowledge of the horrors and of their magic into it. If we could fine-tune the spell in such a way, it should be able to detect horrors. Noraim seemed to chuckle at Linthus's pleasure at finding the solution to this new problem. She noticed his amusement, reminding herself that mere minutes ago he had been forced to imprison her in a stasis spell. She felt somewhat embarrassed and tried to forget it. Noraim, however, did not. I see your passion for knowledge is indeed as strong as mine. Just moments ago I had to use threats to keep you in line. Now you're as excited as I've ever seen you. Yes, you're correct. We must alter the spell pattern to trigger an alert to the wearer that has detected horrors or their spawn. To do that, we must weave horror knowledge into the spell's pattern. That is why I've had you studying horrors and their magic, so that you might be able to add your knowledge to the spell's pattern. But I don't think I've accumulated enough horror knowledge for that. I've only studied... Noraim cut her off. Before we get into that, let me show you how the spell will work. He walked over to one of the locked cabinets along the wall opposite his workbench. Unlocking the door, he removed a small wooden box from the cabinet and carried it over to the table where Linthus stood. He placed the box on the table and opened it. Inside the box was a piece of amber. Noraim picked it up, showing it to Linthus, allowing her to more closely examine it. Look at this with your astral vision and tell me what you see. Linthus did as Noraim instructed. 
As she tuned her astral vision toward the piece of amber, a magical aura filled her sight. It did not have a pattern itself, at least not a pattern that Linthus recognized, but she could see an aura of magical energy, dotted with specks of bright light, much like stars in an evening sky. She returned to her normal vision to more closely examine the physical form of the amber. It was roughly oval-shaped, almost egg-like, but obviously man-made. It was but three inches in height, two inches in diameter. Along one side of the amber was a fine, hair-thin line of metal, a bronze-colored metal that Linthus recognized almost immediately. Is that Orichalcum? Yes, it is, Noraim said quickly. Tell me, what did you see with your astral vision? Linthus described the magical aura and specks of light. Those specks of light, as you call them, are bits of elemental earth that have been woven into the pattern of the amber. They, along with the orichalcum band, give the amber its magical aura. This is to become the detector that the Brella so desires. The amber will glow when the spell detects horrors or horror taint, but we still need to place the spell pattern into the amber. It is constructed so that it is possible to weave spell patterns into it. But before we get to that, pay close attention over here. Noraim sat down the amber and walked over to a bit of wall that was still clean. In this spot, he drew a small version of the spell pattern, then inserted a symbol for horror knowledge in the middle of the pattern, explaining that the knowledge would later be woven into the spell pattern. He then added a completely new portion to the spell, one connected to a loose spell thread. At the far side of the wall, he drew a symbol representing amber and continued the spell thread into the symbol. Here's how the item will work. The spell will detect all astral presences within its range. As the information flows through the spell pattern, it will be channeled into and through the horror knowledge. If the information is that of normal or non-horror-tainted images, the spell will simply continue to function with no change. If, however, the spell detects horror-tainted magic, it will trigger this thread, leading to the amber, which has been constructed to glow when the thread is energized. Linthus could barely withhold her wonderment. Master, she breathed softly, I never knew we were this close. Would you care to try it? Yes, but how? It's quite simple, really, Linthus. First, you must cast the astral sensing spell, then weave a spell thread into the amber. Then we put a source of horror corruption near you to see if you can notice the difference, and if the amber glows as it should. Linthus nodded, but wanted to be sure she understood everything. First, I cast the spell, and then weave the thread to the amber. Yes, that's correct. But we must exercise caution. You must stand in the middle of the experimentation area, over there. Linthus flew over and landed in the middle of the spell pattern on the floor, holding the amber in one of her tiny hands. Now cast the spell, Noraim told her, his eyes glowing with excitement. But what about the horror knowledge? We haven't yet woven it into the spell pattern. Oh, not to worry, Linthus. The reason I'm asking you to perform this experiment is because of your extensive knowledge of horrors and horror magic. That's been your purpose in this process. If this test works, we'll weave your knowledge into the pattern. For now, you stand in that portion of the spell pattern that will eventually contain the horror knowledge, and so your knowledge will take its place. Linthus began to weave the spell thread for this new spell, seeing Noraim becoming visibly anxious as he watched her work. Having finished the spell thread, she continued to cast the spell itself. When its pattern was activated, however, the power of the spell nearly overwhelmed her. It was much more enhanced than she had anticipated. She was sensing astral images at a much greater range and intensity than ever before. Master, this is almost too much to take in, but don't we need a source of corruption to fully test it? Shall I stop now and we can try again later? As Linthus was saying these words, she saw Noraim walk over to the cabinet again, this time pulling out the rune-covered box that contained the horror-tainted sword. Her normal vision was blurred by the onslaught of astral images and impressions flowing in from the room around her. Nearly everything around her, even the spell pattern, was pulsing with magic. But of course it was pulsing. The spell was active, flowing through her. As she followed the pulses of magic that flowed through the spell pattern, she could see the portion along the wall that had been covered. Peering into that yet unexplored portion of the spell pattern, she saw a helix-like shape, vaguely familiar but not immediately recognizable. The shape seemed to be from a recent memory, but one that was clouded at the same time. Linthus tried to recall where she'd seen it before, but her focus was interrupted by Noraim's voice. No, we will continue the experiment right now. I took the liberty of obtaining the horror-marked sword again, but before I open the box, I want you to weave the spell thread to the amber. But you didn't say, weave the thread now, I say. Do not defy me. Linthus wove the thread to the amber more out of fear of her teacher than to continue the experiment. 
but even as she did so, she tried to shut down the spell. If this new spell was as powerful as it seemed, being exposed to that horror-marked sword would be terrifying. It was then that Linthus first began to feel fear, for even as she tried to shut down the spell, it held fast. The connection between her, the spell pattern, and the amber kept the spell active despite her best efforts to stop it. Master, I, I can't stop the spell. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Why would you want to stop the spell now? We have to see if it will work. Even as he spoke those words, Noraim was casting a quick spell, and Linthus felt a sharp pain in her hand, the one holding the amber. A tiny drop of blood swelled from a minute puncture made by the wizard's spell. Looking down at the blood, Linthus saw the red drop being sucked quickly into the amber, disappearing immediately. And at the same time, the intensity of the spell became even stronger. Gazing horrified at the amber in her hand, she saw that same helix shape that had shown up in the concealed portion of the spell. The previous shape had been more complex, as though it had more depth. This one was quite simple. Oh, Master, what are you doing? You never— Just making sure you do nothing to interrupt the experiment before it's complete, he said opening the box containing the horror-marked sword. As the box opened, Linthus could feel the horror magic in the sword course through her body, and as she looked at the amber, it glowed. From deep within it came a bright light, much as the kernels of elemental earth within the amber did when seen with her astral vision. Master, look! It works! It works! Please, Master, can you now close the box and help me shut down the spell? Noraim was staring at the amber, eyes shining and a strange smile tilting one side of his mouth. So it does work, he murmured, and much better than in all the other subjects. Must be the blood magic that enhances its performance. As soon as those words passed his lips, Linthus remembered where she had seen the helix shape. It had been part of the pattern she'd seen during the blood magic experiments they had performed days before, the experiments in which a woman had died before her eyes. That was what Noraim had tried to keep from her. The experiments with the slaves, the blood magic experiments in particular, had also been woven into the spell's pattern. That must be what gave the spell its incredible power. And now she was trapped in the grip of the spell and its crazed creator. Other subjects? What other subjects? You said... I said what? Did you think you're the first one to try it? I wouldn't have taken the final steps in this project until I knew it could work now, would I? What, what do you mean, final steps? You still need me to weave the horror knowledge into the spell pattern, don't you, Master? You still need to learn how to get the spell into the amber, isn't that so? You're not finished! Noraim laughed out loud. Linthus wanted to flee, but the horror magic disoriented her so that she could barely move. Do you remember when I suggested that this spell might require a life force that could maintain the spell from within the item? What it needed was one source that contained both the life force and the ability to see the fine subtleties of astral patterns. You, Linthus, are just that. In fact, you contain all three of the needed ingredients, because you also contain the horror knowledge. Now all I need do is place you in the amber, and the Brella will have his prize. What? she shrieked. Though nearly delirious, Linthus began to weave a thread for a spell. Noraim knew not which, but it didn't matter. He saw that he was what he was waiting for and gestured as he spoke a trigger word, the same word he'd spoken earlier. Just as before, Noraim's stasis spell caught the windling, holding her still, and though she couldn't move, speak, or breathe, she could still feel the horror magic emanating from the sword flow through her body as she could feel the magic of the spell pulse through her, through the spell pattern and into the amber. She could also feel the spell thread she had just woven pulsing with her magic, looking for its destination. It was as though time had frozen. She didn't feel the drain from the spell or the thread, nor did she find herself getting short of breath. Noraim's stasis spell froze her every function, but allowed magic to continue to flow through her. As she saw the thread swaying to and fro, it reminded her of the last moments before the slave Nariana had met her death through a misguided use of magic. Linthus feared that similar fate awaited her. As she tried in desperation to break free, her worst fear came into being. The scream was only in her mind, but the pain that shot through her was searing, combining with the horror magic that flowed through her to create a whirlwind of sensations. Linthus had not thought such pain possible, and she was utterly powerless to stop it. She looked at Noraim, who was visibly engaged in working this latest spell, but the Noraim she saw was suddenly larger than before. He had taken the amber from her and now held it in his hand, 
As she also stared at the amber, it too seemed to be growing in size. Linthus continued to scream in her mind, all the while she grew smaller and smaller and smaller. It also felt as though her body was becoming less solid as it moved closer and closer to the amber. Though her body seemed to be fading, the pain did not. If anything, the pain increased, growing bigger like all the rest of the world around her. The amber glowed brighter and brighter as it grew to be nearly as large as Linthus herself. She couldn't help but continue to scream as she saw herself being drawn toward the amber. As her feet were being sucked into the stone, she felt yet another powerful source of magic begin to mingle with her sensations. Her normal senses were all but useless now. She saw only the astral, and in that world she was flowing through the spell pattern and into the amber. As more of her body was sucked into the amber, the magic surge from its power became even more intense. Her senses were now nothing but a crude combination of the pain of Noraim's spell and the magical energies of the amber flowing into her body. She struggled for one last look up at Noraim, now a giant towering over her tiny form. The amber floated within a stream of arcane energies that arced from one of the wizard's hands to the other. High above the amber, she could see Noraim's face, a study in concentration, at last revealing to Linthus her teacher's true nature. She screamed again, soundlessly, helplessly, eternally. The amber dropped suddenly as Noraim's spell locked Linthus's life force into its orichalcum line form. It still glowed brightly, and only then did the wizard realize that the rune-covered box was still open, allowing the amber to detect the horror magic held in the sword. As he closed the box, the stone's glow faded. Noraim picked up the amber and held it up to the light quartz. Inside, he could see the tiny figure of Linthus, seemingly in flight, yet forever still. He then walked to the cabinet from which he had taken both the amber and the sword. This time he drew forth a long chain made of finely crafted silver-gold links. The chain had no clasp, but was large enough to fit over the head of any but a troll. From the chain hung a setting, one the precise size of the amber piece that now held Linthus forever imprisoned within it. He set the chain down on the nearby workbench and fit the amber into the setting. The stone snapped into place just as the jeweler had told him it would. He then set the amulet carefully into a small cloth-lined box, and without a backward glance, walked out of his lab and through the streets of Avain to the Brella's palace. And that is the end of that tale. Thank you for sticking around. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, the conclusion of that is a little bit spoiled, perhaps, by the cover image uh, to the side there. But I still think it's a, a great little story. And there are more tales in this collection. Um, and perhaps we will share those another time. Uh, that wraps up our first day here at Fredonia Con. Uh, once again, thank you for hanging out. If you are just discovering this, uh, we do have slots still open at various tables over the course of this weekend. Um, visit facetgames.com. Uh, where you can get a link to uh, our Discord, where all sorts of information uh, is going on. Um, and thank you to everybody, not only in our Discord who is watching this, but also on Twitch. Um, I appreciate you hanging out and sticking around uh, for this. Um, that will do it for me. It is I'm on the East Coast, so it is just about 1.30 a.m. here on Friday night. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. And say goodnight, and uh, hope to see some of you folks tomorrow. <laughs>